Good morning and welcome to this special edition of the Prajna Gender Talks. Actually, every edition has been special because going digital has allowed me to invite several old friends, mentors, akkas into this series. And for us also in the last few months to celebrate the history of women's activism in a variety of uh, locations. In August, we had Sabha Katak talk about Pakistan. We have Vibhuti Patel today talking about Maharashtra. In December, Meghna Guha Thakurta will talk about women's activism in Bangladesh. And later in the year, we will have others. Uh, in months to come, we will have others talk about different locations as well, which um, is something that is very, uh, I mean, it's important for us to do this in the PGT because we actually began as a Women's History Roundtable series. And then we were transformed over time into this avatar. Uh, so that's one reason that I'm really happy to have a booty. The other, of course, is uh, there is an official bio, which I re realize I haven't pulled up fast enough. Um, and I will do so now. But I also want to say that Vibhuti is someone I've known literally almost all my life. And uh, one reason that I do what I do and one reason that Prajna has shaped the way that it is, is because of all these didis and akkas that I grew up around, that I, I, watched, them, I watched them do their activist work with joy, with passion, with commitment, and untiringly and um, in ways that were not dependent on grants and not dependent on formal structures. They were built on solidarities and friendships and lifelong friendships that I have seen them keep and have been able to keep connection and friendship with them as well. So this is just a very special way of working that in some measure, I think Prajnya has been able to emulate um, we have remained as unfettered as the early coalitions of the women's movement in India, um, unconstrained by grant reporting requirements, also underfunded like those early movements, all of that. But I think that what it has allowed us to do is to be creative and responsive and uh, innovative in the things that we have undertaken and to undertake them with breadth rather than be confined to, well, this is, my, um, this is my remit, this is my mandate, this is the subject I work on. We're able to really adapt, which is something again that we have inherited from the old women's movement rather than from the more recent corporate, corporatized NGO structures that we see around us. So for so many reasons, there are so many debts that we owe uh, to Vibhuti and all the other, in my mind, I think of you all as all my Akkas. And so I welcome you with, um, with particular joy and um, uh, happiness to this series. And now I'm going to dig out your uh, bio. You no, huh? I'm going point. to do it now because yeah. I think that it's important to place these things on record. I'm not always efficient about it. But you know, women always say, don't talk about me, don't read my bio, but why? We all deserve a full, you know, Vistarka introduction. And so, here you are. I'm now pulling up your bio data and I'm going to read it because this is for the record. Vibhuti Patel has been active in the women's rights movement since early 1970s. She retired from TIS Mumbai on, in June uh, 2020. She worked at the Advanced Center for Women's Studies, School of Development Studies, TIS, from 17 to 20 after her retirement from SNDT Women's University in 2017. She's currently vice president of the Indian Association for Women's Studies, an expert committee of, of the school in of the School of Gender and Development Studies, IGNU Delhi. Vibhuti Patel is a PhD degree holder in economics from the University of Bombay. She was awarded a visiting fellowship to the London School of Economics and Political Science from the Association of Commonwealth Universities in 92-93. Over the last 40 years, she has authored and co-authored 12 books, edited and co-edited nine books, 
and contributed over 100 papers as chapters in various books edited by others. She has also authored and co-authored 34 research monographs and reports. Her research papers, comments, commentaries, and reviews have been published in the national as well as internationally, international academic journals. She has prepared a base paper on gender for the Mumbai Human Development Report in 2010, the Mumbai Human Development Report again in 2012, and the MMRDA Human Development Report 2012 for the government of Maharashtra. She contributed three chapters for an expert committee report on socioeconomic status of Muslims in Maharashtra for the Maharashtra State Minority Commission in 2013. As an expert committee member of the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls of the UN Human Rights Council, she contributed a report on women's, women's human rights in the changing world of work 2020. Vibhuti is also uh, an early documentarian of the women's movement in India, being, as she keeps reminding me, one of the few people who had a camera back then and who used it liberally, regardless of the price of film and processing. And so thanks to her, we have documentation of meetings that the press would have never attended and that we would have absolutely no record of otherwise. And a friend of mine said, when I posted this event, she has an archival collection. She also has an archival memory. And, um, you know, so I can keep saying things about you, Vibhuti, but now I'm going to hand over to you. I'm so happy you're here. Good morning. First of all, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to uh, Swanaji for giving me this opportunity and the Prajna team for making all the preparatory uh, announcements and uh, I would like to share my uh, PPT. Uh, oh, oh, is it with? Oh, so I have to share from here. Yeah, is it visible now? Not yet. Huh, Abhi? Huh? Now okay. it is. It is becoming. Yeah, but it says join the conversation. Follow our blog. It says started screen sharing. Maybe it's the wrong window. We can't see anything yet, though. That's what. So what do I do now? Because it's go says back. No Just un un unshare again. Stop share. But it doesn't show, no. Uh, click on the bottom of the Stop screen. Share, and the menu yeah. will come okay, back. I have done. Yeah. Now, share screen. I can see mine uh, is one minute. We could do it no earlier. Yeah, it worked earlier. Why doesn't it open now? Uh, got it now. Ma'am, can you stop share it and then? Is it now visible? No. Why? Where is stop share? I don't see stop share. Um, you haven't started sharing, so you'll have to go back to Zoom, share it again, and then. Hi, is it? Okay. Starting. Yes. There we go. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to say the background of the whole uh, visual and oral history. It was in 10th standard when my papa gifted me a camera. It was just lying in the cupboard and people would just joke that you gave your camera only to your enemy uh, because those days uh, it was very expensive. Uh, even to buy a roll color and black and white and uh, also getting, getting it processed, making trips to studio and all that. Uh, but And I also became very active in the social movements, especially the trade, the trade union and students movement in the early 70s. And uh, there was also anti price rise movement. I was working in Baroda. At that time, I never used it. But uh, when the anti price rise movement took place in 1974, then I started using it uh, extensively because women activists would tell me that they would bring your camera. So here, the first photograph that you see is that of... Uh, 
a very big public meeting in Pune uh, in solidarity with Mathura, a tribal girl who was gang raped in a, by two policemen, uh, a uniform policemen in, at the police station. And this is a big rally uh, we had in Mumbai, uh, in the uh, South Bombay. Now, I would like to give the background of women's movement in Maharashtra. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that uh, Maharashtra had a historical legacy of so many liberation struggles and liber bhakti movement that from 12th century to 16th century, so many saint poets, they had talked about liberatory aspects of women's uh, existential uh, situation. Uh, it's a social reform movement in the 19th century where uh, women like Savitri Bai Phule or, uh, or uh, uh, the Tara Bai Shinde who wrote Sri Purush Tulna, Ram, Rama Bai Ranade, Pandita Rama Bai, all of them had taken up the issue of uh, fight against female infanticide, uh, prohibition of child marriage. There was a big age of consent debate we had in uh, uh, Maharashtra when the Rakma Bai, she challenged the, to cohabit with her husband. Then we also had uh, 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 many efforts being made by uh, women social reformers for establishment of institution, for vocational training, for education, for making women economically self-sufficient, uh, abandoned and widow women who, who were totally social, like who were the social rejects, they held their hand. And they were also patriotic, they also, were anti part of the anti-colonial struggle. And in the 20th century, we had a freedom movement in which women in both rural and urban Maharashtra, they played a very important role in uh, uh, Quit India movement. They uh, attended satyagras and picketing. And the, uh, there was a very strong non-Brahmin movement also, which was there only in two states, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, in which uh, so many women, not only from the upper caste and upper class, but also from uh, all other layers of society and socially excluded and marginalized communities, whether they were tribal women or, or Dalit women, women from uh, other backward caste, all of them took part in the non brahmin movement. And this is the background in which we see that the new uh, self-organizations of women that happened in the early 70s, uh, my first exposure to women's movement in Maharashtra was in the early 70s, where women uh, from tribal areas of uh, uh, Nandurbar district, uh, they had and Dule district and Nandurbar Taluka, they, they had a big demonstration uh, demanding employment guarantee scheme, Rojgar Hami Yojana, what they call. So uh, that was a very eye-opening uh, experience for me because they were not talking about the Western feminist theories or anything. They were take, taking up the livelihood issues and they said that the only self-organization was a solution to uh, solve our problems. And the song which they were saying that the Venu Bai come with us, why are you just sitting alone? Uh, you won't get anything. We have to challenge patriarchy. We have to challenge uh, uh, the, uh, the oppressive order. We have to get united. We have to take part in politics. We have to uh, 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 strive together and women united will never be defeated. So this is what they were singing in Marathi. And I think I, I, I was highly impressed by that. What we see in the first wave of feminist uh, feminism, where we saw that the phase which was marked by the first generation of English educated women struggle against child marriage, widow burning, female infanticide, efforts for education and voting right of women, which we saw right from 1910 uh, to 1940, 1950. If we read the documents and the debates that were happening in All India Women's Conference or YWCA or uh, within Congress, the women's wing of Congress, these were the kind of issues they were, they were being discussed. So to say that Indian women got right to vote on platter, I think that is that, that would be wrong to say that because women had to really convince their male comrades and the male colleagues that uh, women are equal citizens. So the journey that began in 19th century social reform movement culminated in a 20th century freedom movement resulted in a constitutional guarantee of equality, freedom, equal opportunity for women irrespective of caste, class, creed, race, religion. There was no term called intersectionality 
but they they were they, what they were talking about and all those 15 women who played pivotal role in constitution with in in uh, writing fundamental rights and played a very important role in the constituent assembly they all were extremely conscious about the uh, various interplay of forces of caste class race religion ethnicity that played in determining predicament of women so the women social reformers of 19th and 20th century, the most important were the Savitri Bai Phule and her co-worker Fatima Sheikh and Tara Bai Shinde, uh, Pandita Ramabai. They not only fought against family infanticide, child marriage, caste-based operation, exploitation, deplorable condition of widows and superstition, but also built institution. They were institutional build, institution builders and they provided institutional support to women in difficult circumstances to provide shelter, livelihood to socially ostracized women, unwed mothers and orphaned girls. Uh, they started schools, vocational training institutions to make them economically independent and boosted their morale to lead a life of self-respect and dignity. Uh, uh, Dr. Rakma Bai Sawe's historic uh, challenge uh, of uh, child marriage and refused to, uh, and her refusal to cohabit with her husband, as a result of which we got the age of consent debate and it, that was institutionalized in the Indian legal system. Uh, she dedicated her life. She died at the ripe age of 96, but she built so many institutions. She played an important role in establishing civil hospital in Pune, civil hospital in uh, uh, Surat. Uh, things were becoming difficult for her after that whole polarization of public opinion around uh, age of consent uh, in, uh, in Pune city, which was a very, very conservative. So the progressive things of Baroda and Bhavnagar invited her. She played a very important role in establishing uh, hospital structures in, in, in Bombay Presidency, where Gujarat was also part of Bombay Presidency. So we see that uh, this, uh, the, the support that was provided by the freedom movement and the social reform movement played a very important role in changing the destiny of so many uh, women in those times. Maharashtra has taken lead in articulation of women's rights movement, uh, highlighting genuine concerns of women in rural, urban and tribal areas. It was in the early 70s that tribal women from Dhule district organized a long march to Mumbai to assert their demand for employment guarantee scheme. And here are the photographs. And this was a time where, uh, where, where uh, landlords in that region used to have private army. It was a private army and they would use uh, the, the tribal people were forced to use alcohol. Even the, so many uh, uh, landlords, they were paying their wages in terms of mahua. So you know that mahua fruit, which can be eaten and you can also make a very strong alcohol out of it. So it was under those conditions when Gandhian who started anti-alcohol movement, he was completely brutalized. And women who got conscientized in the process, they started taking up social issues. So the major drought that Maharashtra faced in, 19, in 1972, which, uh, lay, which led to loss of livelihood, uh, massive hunger and malnutrition, against that women, they sang this song, which I told you about, Venubai. So let us get organized and fight for women's liberation. So in 1972, hundreds of women from all walks of life, teachers, students, journalists, researchers, working women, domestic workers, devdasis, adivasis, students, youth, all of them enthusiastically participated in what I would call is the first uh, such gathering of the women's liberation movement. It was held in Pune. And in the city of Bombay, women working in the offices organized massive rally asking for, we want husband, we want job. That was a time when any working woman uh, gave her wedding card or she told the, to the boss about her engagement, she would be given termination order. And that was a time where thousands of women, they uh, they marched in the South Bombay area and the Fort area with this slogan that we want husband, we want job. That means no married woman should be thrown out of job. And that was the time where even public sector, uh, the monopoly of aviation industry was with the Indian government. And they were also forcing air hostesses to compulsorily retire at the age of 35. So you can imagine this was such a revolutionary action which the women in women's collect, uh, collective took. And we know Suman Katri, uh, Jyoti Mapsekar's mother, who wrote a beautiful song it's, it, it is now it was used even for the dance palace where she talked about women from all walks of working women 
from rural, urban, and tribal areas come together, and, and there were each uh, verse, each stanza talked about the life of a clerk, another one, life of an industrial worker, third one talked about the informal sector worker, fourth one talked about how the tribal women's uh, daily grind uh, were, were killing. So, and the, why there was a need for the unity of women from all sectors of the economy and all sections of society. In 1974, Anti-price rise women's movement gained momentum. In fact, that is how I got to meet these national leaders because I was activist of a students' organization called Study and Struggle Alliance in a small town called Baroda. And uh, uh, we shared our office with the Western Railway Employees Union. And the hall was common while two sides of a small, small offices were, one was our organization, other one was uh, union office. And that uh, they invited uh, uh, stalwarts like Alia Rangrikar, Comrade Alia Rangrikar, Comrade uh, Manju Gandhi, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Murunal Gori, and they shared, they, they uh, saw only two of us, myself and Trupti was a school girl and I was a college girl. And we, they asked us to start Enterprise Rise Women's Movement in Baroda. And we started moving everywhere, like uh, going to the working class basically, low middle class basically, uh, 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 streets, because it was a walled city in which uh, the upper caste and upper class people, they lived in the society, while in the walled city, you, you, the, it was a studying middle class and the uh, working class clusters were there. And we mobilized and made a very big rally of nearly 10,000 women fighting, uh, demanding uh, uh, ration in the PDS, uh, fighting against black marketing holding that was happening. You know that after Indochina war and Indo-Pakistan, uh, Indo-Pak war, and even after Bangladesh war, there was a tremendous inflation in our country and a lot of holding used to take place. Even the ration cards were pawned uh, of the working class because uh, they did that, that there was too much of indebtedness. So this 1974 anti-price rise women's movement, which was, and this is the thing Minal Tai had given me at that time, uh, you can see this, that though I, I, as a student, I had taken part in uh, Enterprise Rise Women's Movement. And when there was a, a Golden Jubilee celebration at that time, they had come up with this memento. Now, uh, in nine, uh, from 25th June to 20, 1975 to 21st March 1977, for 18 months, we had emergency rule. And this emergency rule, most of the activists from Maharashtra, they would take shelter in Gujarat because Gujarat was in opposition. The, they did not use MISA, Maintenance of Internal Service Security Act was not used in Gujarat. So that's how the solidarity between activists in Maharashtra and activists in, in, in Gujarat, especially in Baroda, because Baroda had this new left group where uh, they, they were coming and they were also taking shelter. Uh, so after in the post-emergency period, uh, we, I came to Bombay, that was my, I relocated from Paroda to Bombay, and then I became very active in the women's groups, in uh, the newly formed women's groups. I was also one of the founders of that group. But we must know that uh, in India, emergency rule and in declaration of international women's year by the United Nations coincided. 5,000 women activists of India were behind the bar during emergency. And state was also commemorating International Women's Day. There were so many functions because of International Women's Year. And as a result of this International Women's Year, uh, India signed the Charter on Equality, Development and Peace. And we got this new law called Equal Remuneration Act, which talked about equal opportunity at the time of entry in the workforce, equal treatment, and equal remuneration. So that also was a very important landmark because this act was used by so many women who face discrimination, who face arbitrary uh, 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 dismissal after marriage or maternity because employers did not want to give maternity benefits. So it was a very important thing and many women have used this act filed public interest litigations in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 first happened in Maharashtra. The first public integration was uh, filed by, by, by Audrey, who was working in the multinational company. She joined as a receptionist and she was never given promotion. Each time uh, uh, 
her, her management would ask her to mentor a young boy within six months or a year the boy would become her boss for 20 years all these new recruits became got promoted but Mary, uh, Audrey did not and when this act came she was the first person in India to file public interest litigation in the High Court of Mumbai and with the, uh, for, uh, uh, she was supported by the newly formed women's group she was invited to give um, uh, the, public lectures, uh, YWCA had 85 branches all over India, she, she traveled and after every lecture she also collected signature uh, supporting her petition, we all used to sign, we used to organize a meeting, uh, she won the case in high court but that was, uh, she, she did not, the, still the employers did not implement the decision, she filed Supreme, a case in Supreme Court, Indra Jai Singh was her lawyer and she fought, fought that case pro bono and uh, she won the case in the Supreme Court in 1986, but that was a time for her to uh, retire. But all the women's organizations, they felicitated her victory. Uh, and she was also not at all uh, depressed or demoralized. She said she had opened the gates for millions of Indian women who are facing discrimination at the workplace. And at least 6% of women who are in the organized sector where the protective labor laws have to be implemented, they will get benefit of this thing. And they will also get moral courage to take uh, employers to the task. Now, in the post-emergency period, which was marked by emergence and proliferation of new special interest groups of women writers, women students, scholars, journalists, women employees, women officers, work, uh, and women workers, both under the banner of socialist and left political parties, as well as also the aut autonomous women's group. The, the women who felt that all these political parties and social movements and the big mass organizations, they were relegating women's issues in the background because for them it was the caste issue or a class issue or question of ethnicity or question of economic uh, struggles were more, very important. And so many of them also believe that once we have a social transformation or a revolution, automatically all other forms of inequalities and hierarchies will be eliminated. That was not acceptable because the, the, the women who were active in right from say early 70s till 80, those eight, nine years, they felt that uh, we, in a day-to-day -day life also, we need to take up question of women, whether if, 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 uh, if women were being battered, if there was a domestic violence, if there was a, a sexual harassment, if there was a, a discrimination at workplace, we can't postpone women's issues because that was the, the mindset of the common struggles where the women's issues can wait. So that was the uh, uh, factor which made some of us to start autonomous women's group. And the first autonomous women's group in Mumbai that was started was a, 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 was a socialist women's group. We discussed the issues of paid and unpaid work. We discussed issues of discrimination at workplace, uh, 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 women's violence against women, gender as a term was not there, but violence against women that was happening. Women, uh, 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 women's charter within the trade union movement, all these issues were being discussed. And we also started a newsletter in English called Feminist Network. And it was in Hindi, we used to take out a cyclostyle edition called Socialist Women's Group. So these newly formed women's groups in Pune, Mumbai, Nash, uh, in, in, in the uh, Nagpur, or uh, in the rural uh, part of, say, uh, 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 Maharashtra, they forged united front on a specific issues and jointly commemorated March 8, uh, International Women's Day, as an act of solidarity and sisterhood that symbolized women's strength. It was in uh, 1980. In response to Supreme Court's misogynistic uh, judgment by Justice Chandrachur of, uh, in case of a gang rape of a teenage girl, Madhura, in Chandrapur district of Maharashtra, that first collective action began from Mumbai and Forum Against Rape was formed in 1980. The open letter by Madhura's lawyer, she fought her case pro bono nearly for eight years because Madhura was raped in 72, the judgment came in 79, and uh, she uh, first took it up in the Nagpur Sessions Court, uh, and which did not, which did, which, which cast aspersion on Mathura's character. And she said it was a willing intercourse with the policeman and policemen were not uh, at all punished. They, they, uh, and they, they were scot free. And the case came to Bombay High Court, which gave them rigorous imprisonment with an argument that whatever said that time, Mathura was a child and any sexual relation with a child is a rape. And uh, both the Ganpat and Tukara police constables were given like uh, rigorous imprisonment for 10 years. 
And when this policeman approached the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court judgment was up, if you can read the Supreme Court judgment, it is there on Google. It was full of misogyny. It is full of uh, 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 prejudice against a poor tribal girl and which enraged four lawyers, four law teachers of Delhi University, Professor Ravi Kelkar, Professor Upendra Bakshi, Professor Latika Sarkar, and by then uh, Vasudha had also become a, uh, had a, become a professor, so Vasudha Dagambar. They signed, uh, they wrote an open letter, which was circulated by Forum Against Oppression of Women. We managed to get one copy of it uh, from a journal, because you know that in the post-emergency period, uh, for the first time, like, innumerable journals and periodicals and weeklies and monthly magazines had come out. I think one of them was Probe and Probe was focusing on basically the violation of human rights and uh, uh, during 18 months of emergency. So the question of civil liberties, human rights, democratic rights was extremely important. The left organization used the term democratic rights while the liberals, they used the term civil liberties and uh, also the, so many such organizations had come up and many journals had come. So in one of these journals from the Wheeler book stall of Borivali Station, I managed to get a copy of this issue for Rope. And we uh, read this letter in our group called Socialist Women's Group. We cyclostyle made a copy of a cyclostyle copy of this uh, open letter because those days uh, Xeroxing or uh, photocopying, it was not so much in uh, it was still entering the Indian market, but what we, we used to do was we, we would cut stencil uh, on our typewriter. You remove a ribbon and you cut the stencil. And if it is in, in Hindi or regional language, there used to be stencil cut up. So with that, we had to write. So this is how we, we made 500 copies of this uh, open letter and so sent it by book post to all the newly formed organizations we had connected with between the period of 1977 to 1970, in two years' time, all those who had been at the receiving band of the emergency rule, who the activists in the students' movement, tribal movement, the newly formed Dalit organizations, or uh, students' organization, anti-price rights movement, all of them who had faced uh, violation of democratic rights, police brutality, uh, sexual, uh, sexual advances and sexual uh, violence by the uh, state repressive forces, all of them, uh, they, they, they were in touch with us and they were on our mailing list and we shared it. And then we had in 1980, uh, December, a uh, national conference on perspective for women's liberation movement in India. Initially, it was going to be, a, a focus was only on rape, but women who, in the, our campaign, so many women who also joined had, they had faced various forms of violence in their life and uh, they, they they said that we should also take up the issue of domestic violence, we should take up the issue of, 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 of sexism in media, uh, women, the, like there was a young women journalist who were also very active by then, or who, who had joined either as a reporter or as a sub-editor or as a correspondent, they were also facing tremendous sexism and misogyny in their profession, so we should take it up. Not only portrayal of women, which was a problematic, but also how women journalists were being treated. Then the question of women in health, because gross violation of uh, body integrity and women's uh, dignity had taken place during emergency in the name of population control policy. Many of you must have seen a film by Deepa Dhanraj, or uh, something like a war, how women's uterus and women's reproductive ability was treated as a, a, with a total disrespect and uh, indignity uh, that is being taken up. And uh, so we took up the, the three, uh, four thematic areas. First of all, was violence against women. Second one, women in law, because everything was directed at bringing the legal reforms in the existing system. Then the question of uh, women in media and women in health. Now, in the if we try to encapsulate empowerment of women in the second wave of feminism, what we see that the class character of these women was they were educated middle class women who were actively involved in the social movements, where, uh, uh, whether they were students' movement, youth movement, workers' movement, peasant movement, tribal movement, and also civil liberties and democratic rights organizations. They abhorred paternalism of the 
earlier organizations which were dominated by upper caste, upper class women who saw women's work with the women as a charitable act or a philanthropic act. While these women, they said, we are not doing charity, we are not doing philanthropy. We declare, they declared themselves as the women's rights activists. So after a lot of debate, uh, it was accepted that we will call ourselves women's rights activists. And they uh, played a very important, they said, we are not fighting someone else's battle. We are fighting our own battles. Personal is political. And we also uh, individually, if we fight, we will face witch hunting. There is a need for collective action. And this is the spirit that you see. And with this spirit ma ma in Maharashtra, all rural, urban, and tribal organizations where women were active, they formed Stri Mukti Andolan Samparka Samiti, Women's Liberation Coordination Committee. Stri Mukti was a very important term. And you can see here the stalwarts like uh, uh, Alia Rangnikar, who is there in the extreme left. Then you can see Mnuna Taikore. You can uh, see Prabha, uh, 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 Comrade Prabha. And uh, here there was a, the, the left side. The photograph is that of a, uh, uh, women uh, fighting against price rise. The main concerns of the women's movement during the second wave of feminism in a post-independence period that we had is the commemoration of March 8. So all from 1980, we can see 1977 itself, always on March 8, all women's organizations in Maharashtra, in whichever city they are, they come on a common platform. The only line drawn is that there you have to be progressive, secular humanist, left, liberal, Gandhian, all of them who have a progressive ideas about uh, women and society in general, uh, they, they are the ones who come together. Uh, declining sex ratio had become a very important concern. You know that it was towards equality report, which was tabled in the Parliament of India in 1974. From Maharashtra, we had Dr. Neera Desai, who was a member of the Status of Women's Committee. And the three startling revelation of towards equality report were declining sex ratio, right, throughout the history of census of India declining work participation of women because the towards equality report showed what 11 percent women as main workers which was a very very demoralizing and depressing because even in the colonial times we had 35 percent 36 37 percent work participation of women uh, so uh, uh, there were economists who also said that declining work participation was uh, was directly linked to increasing dowry murders of women because women were treated as a burden because when economic independence is a minimum necessary condition. So uh, we, so many of us started working on declining sex. In fact, when in 1974, when uh, uh, these stalwarts came to Baroda at that time. I had told them the stories of uh, Patidar community from where I come from. Uh, so many of them were using sex selective abortions uh, to eliminate girl child. But, uh, but the, the stalwarts, they did not believe me. They said, ma'am, baby, you are reading too many science fiction. Here in India, women don't even have safe drinking water. Do you think that they will spend money for testing amniotic fluid? But I think scenario completely changed because during emergency, the, the sex selective abortion and amniocentesis tests were used only in the medical colleges for research, but they got commercialized in the post-independence period, uh, post-emergency uh, period. And we saw so many sex selection clinics uh, started appearing. In the local train of Mumbai, while traveling in a women's compartment, we would see advertisements in Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati, Urdu, uh, 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 which say that safe abortion, 80 rupees, garba uh, odak, uh, 70 rupees. So in 150 rupees, you can solve your problem of dowry. You know, that was the kind of very aggressive advertisement you used to see in this women's compartment in the local train. And that made us, because we thought that garba odak's English translation would be pregnancy test. But when, while working in the Basti, while working with the uh, women in the neighborhood, we came to know that Garpa Odak means it was a sex selection. And this sex selection test were treated as a population control measure because they believed that in anticipation of a boy, Indian women go on producing girls and daughters. So we also started doing research in 1982. We ourselves posed, six of us posed as pregnant women and we realized we we, talk, we went to two government hospitals, two private clinics, and two 
private, big, well-known hospitals, and we found out that it was rampant uh, cases of sex with uh, amniocentesis test, chorion villi biopsy test were taking place. Uh, and if the fetus was found to be female, they were resorting to female uh, uh, to, to uh, abortion. And that's how in 19, uh, we formed forum against sex selection and sex, uh, sex determination and sex selection. Because by then, 1986, we also saw, got, got so many research reports where Indian doctors and the sophisticated clinics were using sex pre-selection technology, uh, where you, you fertilize egg using technology of in vitro fertilization, gift and zift. You fertilize an egg, take Y sperm from uh, Y chromosome from sperm and X chromosome from ova, and you fertilize egg and insert it into a woman's womb to get a baby boy. So that became a very important concern. Gender gap in education, that was a very important because the, the 1981 census, 1991 census also showed that we had a huge gender gap in education and that's why that was taken up. Reproductive rights of women right from the emergency period, reproductive rights and got the attention of the, the feminist and uh, that became a very important concern. Forum, against, uh, forum for Women's Health took it up. Uh, violence against women, rape, dowry murder, they were con constantly so many women's organizations started providing institutional support to women survivor of violence. So women's center in Mumbai was the first one. Swadhar was formed uh, by Samajwadi Mahila Sabha, Aidwa and Janwadi women's organization. They also did a massive study as well as support to women survivors of violence, uh, not only in Bombay, but in several cities. And this, whether it was a Kolhapur or Sangli or Satara or Pune, Nagpur, uh, Nagpur formed Sima Sakreji, who had provided support to Mathura right from 1972. Consistently, she stood by Mathura uh, till Mathura got married and had children. Uh, she had started Forum against uh, Operation Nari Atyachar Virodhi Manch in Nagpur. Sima Tai passed away recently. Portrayal of Women in Media, the Network for Women in Media was formed in the early 80s and they were now it is a very big organization or in all cases of sexual violence of women uh, in uh, predatory behavior of employers in the media houses have been uh, taken up by uh, network for women in media network for women in media works at the three level it monitors the media it does the media monitoring sexism in media is uh, taken uh, uh, taken up by the, the and the extensive writing they do what is what can be the alternate portrayal of women and how to promote women's agency that is also uh, the task which uh, network does they organize workshops they do media monitoring and they also provide support to young women journalists uh, and uh, who are at the receiving end of the media uh, houses because media houses they have not cre created that uh, safeguards for safe workplace for women. So I think that that is also taken up. Unpaid care work and non-recognition of women work became a very important theme for, uh, uh, for women's organizations. In fact, so many study circles which were organized by Sri Uvacha, Maitri, uh, which was started by Dr. Chaya Tata, uh, they uh, uh, they focused on paid and unpaid work. Gay Lombard did a very important study on ekalnari of single women and the kind of uh, this kind of unpaid work. How did it result in women-headed households to be poorest of the poor households? By 1984, in 1984, Bombay experienced extremely gruesome riots in Bivandi. <laughs> All the feminist in uh, uh, the region, they were active in relief operations. They were also, they came up with the investigative report and they also wrote extensively, not only in English, but also in regional languages, uh, in Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati, Urdu, about uh, the, the impact of these riots uh, on women. Before that, in 1978, we had seen the Maratwad riots, Namantar uh, Andolan, uh, where uh, 1,200 villages were burning. Dalit women were, they faced tremendous atrocities by the caste Hindus, and that was also being reported by Atyachar. 
Chal Virodhi Samiti. In fact, Feminist Network had extensively reported about it and uh, written many, many articles in several languages. So the caste riots, communal riots, how it is taking toll of women, how women suffer the most during uh, such riots, not only in terms of loss of mobility, loss of uh, 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 more confinement, uh, insular feelings that are created, and the how women's bodies are used for setting the score by the uh, by the two conflicting groups uh, that is uh, that also came out uh, women's decision making and political participation at one level the debates were going on about women's representation in the political bodies because women were very active in the social movement you throughout the 1980s we saw women were always at the forefront of all struggles not only women specific struggles but even over like with uh, uh, livelihood issues, whether it was a, a slum clearance or a women housing right or a right of uh, right to work, all these issues women were at the forefront. But when it came to electoral politics, women were completely marginalized. It was the muscle power uh, and money power that prevailed. So the question of reservation for women were also being discussed. And by then we also saw individual women uh, or individual individuals with alternate sexualities they started they also started having dialogue with the women's groups and the persecution and ostracization that phase was uh, individually taken up not as a political issue in the initial phase but now then later on it became also very important concern so livelihood issues of women in Maharashtra, we know so many socialists and the communist women. Here is a Pramila Dandavati. She is uh, speaking, uh, addressing a rally. We had women, uh, so many women, Chalo Bombay, uh, long march of women traveling from all over all the districts and the rural and uh, uh, tribal areas. They would come to Bombay to give memorandum petition to the, uh, to the chief minister. Then uh, big public meetings used to take place in Bombay and Pune were the major centers for such public meetings. This is a public meeting for solidarity for, uh, for, for Mathura in 1980. Uh, this is the in 1979 when we got this open letter by these four lawyers. Uh, we cut the stencil, so I'm cutting the stencil here. And uh, we uh, this uh, we, we got 500 copies made. We had to travel even in the suburbs of Mumbai, did not have a rolling center. We also had a cyclo styling machine. We, we did the fundraising, had a cyclo styling machine installed in my drawing room. That time my house was a commune. It was a two, one room, one bedroom, hall kitchen house. And four of us used to stay. Two used to work in trade union movement. One was working in, with the railway union and I was working in both railway union as well as uh, uh, women's groups and was also doing my PhD at that time. By 1980, when there was a Chalo Delhi, so from Maharashtra also, many of us went to Delhi and Parliament of India was encircled by women's chain. And here you can see my comrade Brinda Karat, she's addressing the rally in Delhi and we played a, a, a groups in Mumbai and Maharashtra. They also, this, we know immediately after that rally, we had a very, very, very important uh, testimony by Maya Tyagi, who was gang raped by four policemen in the in Madhya Pradesh. And it, the woman police officer instigated the police constable uh, and she forced them. <coughs> she only instigated them to rape her, to teach her a lesson because she thought that Maya Tyagi was a decoy. And we approached the prime minister as well as the president of our country, uh, Yani Jail Singh, he was very sympathetic. There were tears in his eyes and he put his shoulder or he put his hand on his on her shoulder and told with tearful eyes that Betty, uh, the, uh, daughter, I understand your pain. By Indira Gandhi gave a stern look uh, at Maya Tyagi and she said Maya Tyagi was wearing some gold on her body and uh, there was some earring or, or, or necklace or something. And she looked at her and she said, Chori ke hai kya? Uh, have you stolen them? Because she was given, uh, she was given report by her people that Maya Tyagi was a decoy. You know? So we, we were very, very much heartbroken. We saw that just by being a biologically woman, uh, you don't become empathetic. No, it is basically your interest and in where do you, where are you located in the power structure that determines what kind of uh, position you are going to take when it comes to 
gender-based violence. Here it's me addressing public rally, uh, uh, Dr. Comrade Manju Gandhi. They are also uh, demanding the two central demands that we had were reopen the Mathura rape case, Mathura ko do, Mathura must get justice, and uh, amendment in the antiquated rape law, which only focused on penile penetration while we, say we were demanding this, the focus should be on circumstantial evidences. So during 1980 to 2011, the women's movement in Maharashtra had taken a wide range of issues such as domestic violence, establishment of one-stop crisis center, why a survivor of violence should be running from pillar to post, from police station to shelter home, to a hospital for her bodily injury. Uh, there should be all the services should converge at one place. So that was the demand. Safety and non-discrimination at workplace, empowerment of women in urban slums and uh, uh, question of women farmers who were also uh, now talking about un uh, unequal wages. Uh, women were not getting the, the implementation of Equal Remuneration Act, solidarity with the Dalit minority and tribal women. And uh, we had the first national conference. You can see here Gail Ombet. She's in the subgroup on women and work. There are subgroup on women and media, subgroup on women and health, subgroup on uh, Ajita Kunnikal Narayan, who was for seven and a half years in a solitary confinement in Kerala prison. She was released after uh, 1977 in the post-emergency period. She was heavily pregnant, so she was given a chair to sit. Neelam Chaturvedi from... Uh, Kanpur Saki Kendra's director and currently the treasurer of National Alliance of Women's uh, Movement, Navo. Uh, she was a young woman at that time working with the trade union, uh, working uh, for the uh, with the textile workers. And we have a group uh, which is talking about women in law. So these are some of the uh, important, I think Swarna was also there as a student volunteer. Her sister Lata Mani, she was in the core group in this organization. Then uh, in, after 1970, uh, 1984 Bombay riots, the focus was on identity politics, uh, Dharmandata Virodhi Kruti Samiti, uh, Women's Action Forum Against Religious Bigotry that was formed. Uh, you can see uh, Alia Tai addressing the rally at Varmali Hall. The Yasona Shukla is addressing the same rally. These are the women who took part, women, middle-class women, working-class women, women in the bastis, textile work, women textile workers, all of them used to take part. Here we have a Nilofar Bhagwat, again a, a, a lawyer from the uh, Supreme Court and High Court lawyer. She was addressed, she was speaking on how the discriminatory family laws are uh, make uh, are treating women unequally in the realm of marriage, divorce, custody of child, uh, paternity, uh, uh, custody, uh, maintenance rights, right to stay in a matrimonial home, right to stay in a parental home. So discriminatory aspects in the family laws, uh, religion-based family laws and customary laws. India has 30,000 customary laws. So that became a focus because while providing support to women survivor of discrimination and violence, we could handle labor laws. We could deal with the criminal laws. But when it came to family laws, the identity politics prevailed. And, and we were defeated in the, because the, the, the emotions would become so high that uh, the, the, it would become a question of a Muslim identity or Hindu identity or a tribal identity or a Sikh identity. Because you know that uh, Khalistanis had also asked for Chadar Nawazi for women that a, a widow of the family must marry a man of the family compulsory. So against that also women had fought. Devra Sati episode in 1987 uh, also brought the issue of uh, uh, widow burning again. And in, Ma in Mumbai, uh, so many streets in the suburbs, newly formed roads, uh, they were named after Mahasati uh, Road and all. Against that also we had, a, we had taken up and we had demonstrations. So many small, small Sati temples had come up all over the city and, and that this was reported in many other cities of Maharashtra so it had happened and Minal Tai, she was the one who took lead that this this type of uh, thing uh, glorification of Sati must be taken to task and we also had a law by then uh, that uh, no glorification of Sati should be allowed in our country and it is a criminal act. Uh, we have Nirmala Sati again a veteran feminist now she's in her 80s uh, she was chairing the session uh, we also had a rally again uh, from different Chalo Mumbai uh, uh, movement. 
in 1981, focusing the issues of the working class women uh, and women from all over Maharashtra had come to uh, the central place in Mumbai and uh, various questions of uh, food security. Uh, Jail Bharao Andolan was there by the tribal organizations because tribal children were uh, not in a school. They were working as child workers in the field. So they, they, the Shamik Shangatna had taken up this issue of right to education for tribal children. So that was the demand. Employment guarantee scheme that every person, who all those who are unemployed, for, for uh, should be getting more than one month they should be get they should get job and the state should provide job then the question of price rise inflation were also taken up the street theater was used as a very effective medium of taking up women's issues here is a play called the bara garacha bara zani 12 women survivor of violence and their life so there were 12 episodes in this play it was a music play, music drama. At another level, we also had a Sri Mukti uh, Sangatna had come up with Mulki Zali Ho. The first uh, act of that show was taken, to, took place in 1984. Uh, the daughter is born. That was also a music ballet that took, took up the whole life cycle of a woman in 1984. In 1980, uh, uh, at the end of the uh, first national conference, we had a Jagriti. Jagriti was also uh, depicting uh, women's woes and women's problems and women's resilience through music ballet after a research in uh, folk songs, folk tales and uh, folk uh, lores. Uh, they were weaved into one uh, music ballet where a woman, pregnant woman in anticipation of a boy, that was a song in Kannada, then we had a song in Malayalam, Gujarati, Hindi, Bhojpuri, and all these songs were woven in to create a one story of a life cycle of a woman, which ends with uh, Subramanyam Bharti's song, Kumiyadenam. So that why women should come together for their liberation. So that was a play, the uh, Jagrati uh, uh, was a play, the uh, music drama that was first made in 1980. Then we had a Mukti, uh, uh, Daughter is Born. That was a play in Marathi, which is now translated in several Indian languages, including Hindi, Gujarati. There are also on YouTube, you can even see that play. Uh, there are the, uh, and, and many other languages. In fact, they, it, the, this Mulgi Zali, who daughter is born, that was supported by the government of Maharashtra and later on by uh, central government also. So they could take it as a jatra, as a carnival. So it was after the play, there would be group discussions, there were books, uh, book exhibitions, there were song sessions, there were a lot of uh, group singing, all, all of that. It created a renaissance in Maharashtra and also there more than, I think, 250 uh, shows have taken place. Now, this Bara Garaja Barazari play uh, that took up the 12 different kind of violence that women are facing, whether it was a domestic violence or a rape or a child sexual abuse, sex work, forced into sex work, uh, then discrimination at workplace, sexual harassment at workplace, uh, street harassment, all these issues were taken up and uh, it, uh, uh, it, it also became very uh, popular. Here you can see Jaini Kasha, She's now a very important activist of Forum for Women and Health. Nata Pratibha Madhukar, who has a channel, she has now organized uh, Bahujan women, uh, women from uh, uh, non brahmin uh, caste. And they are, she also has a Bahujan channel, uh, which you must be familiar with. Uh, you have Swati Japaranjapi, very active in Forum Against Rape. Sandhya Gokhale, they had a group at that time in IIT Bombay. They had a, they used to discuss women's question. They became very active in the forum, and now they are the mainstays of forum. Here you have Amina Thomas. She was survivor of violence. You can see woman in white sari. Her husband was Air India's engineer, and he was extremely brutal and pervert form of violence. Uh, he used to have against. He used to perpetrate on his two boys and Mina. She approach women's organization, women's center. Now she is a very important, she's in a Nashik uh, 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 military uh, school where her student, uh, children studied and she got the employment there. So all of them, the survivor, uh, those who came as a victim of violence, in course of time, they became survivors of violence. That is one thing we feminists talk so proudly that anyone who comes in touch with us gets uh, doesn't lose anything. 
whether it is a bank balance or whether it is a personal loss or loss of self esteem they always become the agent of change they themselves get empowered and they empower women uh, women and all the downtrodden people uh, around them so the first thing that anyone who is a counselor in the women's organization they do they make a checklist of the things where the intervention is required in terms of job in terms of counseling in terms of building self esteem by uh, using singing therapy using group therapy you can uh, using get togethers as a, for for collective empowerment of women and how they themselves become ch ch uh, change agents and supporters of other people in distress the uh, solidarity for the textile workers that happened in 1982 now i'll be very quick a uh, public meeting for women to commemorate uh, women's day 1983 where the focus was on uh, women's work because the 1981 census had shown very very low work participation of women women against communalism that was i told you about the against the bivandi riots uh, women mulki jali ho a play uh, daughter is born the show of it where a mother is counseling her daughter and she is telling her to be subdued and obedient and all that and then how they protest this was a vibhav shukla murder case a young woman who was murdered by superintendent of police father in law and uh, we had a, a solidarity act and we also we were marching towards the high court of mumbai we entered the high court and also we had demonstration there uh, this was against the drought in 1986 rural urban solidarity act where women from all over the a state they they marched to mumbai four generations of women they came together on 14th november children's day it is today at the the, the uh, in 1986 uh, we were we had a 90 year old daughter we had a 60 year old daughter 40 year old daughter the young my youngest was my daughter lara so the slogan was destroy dowry not daughters sex determination is equal to women's sex determination daughters are not for slaughter and we also wrote a postcard with a japan with jawala nehru's stamp and they said that to all those who love their children both boys and girls daughters rally against sex selective abortion on 14th november a uh, rally in mumbai against roop kavar uh, devrala sati Uh, that happened in 1987 network for women in media had played a very important role the journalist said gone there geeta shishu uh, pamela philippos the tista sitalwar all of them had gone to rajasthan they came up with a very very vivid description of what happened in devrala and that was released uh, women against unsafe contraception and anti uh, women population policies 1988 and this same year we also filed a petition against a booklet called how to rape balatkar kasha karta written by some self styled psychologist uh, some uh, and and it was nothing but a pornography and teaching man how to rape a woman and it was sold for 2 rupees at every railway station under the carpet and we filed we we uh, geeta shishu represented uh, network for women in media or nearly 14 women's organizations in mumbai they supported her it was a public interest litigation in the petition the defense lawyer was extremely misogynist and uh, he was civilizing and humiliating geeta we are we met the chief minister and demanded that the defense law should be changed finally dr advocate mehir desai was appointed as a defense lawyer and the book was banned uh, women for land and housing rights the housing rights and land rights became a very important issue two women tribal women in maharashtra bhuri bai and dagi bai they filed public interest litigation in the supreme court of india indira jai singh was the lawyer so tribal women should have a right to land and urban women were asking for the housing rights there was a national campaign for housing rights in which women feminists were very active uh the, this poster campaign like manjushri sarda was a woman marwari woman who was brutally killed by her in laws uh, they, they, they both the parties were very very rich Uh, and uh, 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 there was a manjushri sar the husband he fled he left india uh, uh, and there was a big campaign 
Pune Women's Organization, Nari Saptama, had taken lead. And this became a galvanizing force to have a state wise campaign on violence against women. The poster, uh, which were made by Nari Samtavanj, were, were later on supported by the state, and thousands of copies of the posters were made and distributed to different districts and tehsils and the villages, uh, village panchayat by the government of Maharashtra. Uh, we, in 1990, we had a conference in uh, Kerala, uh, 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 Perspectives for Women's Liberation Movement in Calicut. 2,500 women went there. Hundreds of women from Maharashtra also attended that. The women against price rise of railway tickets, railway, the local trains are extremely important and the railway uh, for the common people. So women uh, demanded that uh, 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 ticket uh, should, uh, the, the price rise in ticket should be uh, eliminated. Indian Association for Women's Movement, uh, Women's Studies had its conference. The first conference was in Mumbai in 1981, immediately after the Women Activist Conference, uh, after four months, our, uh, and in 1988, uh, the uh, IWS conference was in Pune. Here you can see Neera Desai, mother of women's studies in our country, in India. You, are, you can see uh, 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 various gatherings and the group the subgroups that were here you can see Kamla Basin singing you can see Meena Majumdar who is holding poster of Savitri Bai Phule the first teacher of modern education in our country and uh, you can see Indu Agnihotri uh, they all were in the Pune conference uh, in 19, 2002, when the uh, uh, Gujarat riots took place, this was our solidarity from Maharashtra. We said that women's movement for peace and uh, secularism, the Dharma Nirpeksha, Hij Mahan Manata, uh, secularism, uh, secular humanism is the only humanism that we know of, and we all were women in white. So, eliminate inequality, destroy dowry, uh, uh, campaign to save the girl child in 19. 2011 after immediately after the census uh, released the data on declining child sex ratio so the feminist leadership uh, in maharashtra uh, which emerged with the autonomous women's organization uh, it, uh, dialogue between the women's studies and women's movement were forged participatory techniques of research that came out most of the women activists later on became a women's studies scholar combination of theory and practice the theory is very important to get the worldview and to sustain your enthusiasm and uh, and and make your activism more uh, sharper focused and effective uh, so special interest groups were created uh, any time those new groups were created, uh, women's movement in Maharashtra took it up positively. It did not see it as a divisive force, but it saw that now we'll be able to focus uh, more effectively because patriarchy is like an octopus. It, 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 it uh, encircles and, uh, and, and suppresses women's life with its tentacles and all these tentacles, they need to be tackled. Personal is political is still a very important concern in the women's movement in Maharashtra. That's why, uh, and, uh, and the networks, whether it's a local level, state level, national, regional, and global. So we have to work both locally and globally. And the major milestones that women's movement in Maharashtra has had is a single issue platforms have been created. Discourse around consent is going on. Uh, un unjust family laws are still a very important concern and there have been contestations. There are various positions whether we should ask for a common uh, gender just laws or there should be reforms in the uh, existing family laws. Uh, should we use the legislative route or should we use the uh, the the root of uh, or, or uh, uh, people's participation that is also very important because whether you know street fighting is the only way to to change the society or we we, can, we should also have a multi pronged strategy so judicial route versus legislative route when your legislators are not supporting women's question and then you depend more and more on the court. Uh, legal reforms in civil, criminal, and labor laws. Currently, there, there are four uh, labor courts against that women's groups are fighting. Reproductive rights of women, reservation of seats for women in all electoral bodies. Currently, we have only in the local self government bodies, land and housing rights, and special needs of single women. In fact, Ekal Nari Sangatna is very active in Maharashtra. 
So connection between in Indian feminists and international debates and actors in that also women from Maharashtra has felt. And I would like to end with the song which we were singing in 1980 in the rally in which Swarna was also there, breaking the shackles of domesticity, restrictions imposed by tradition, rejecting mindset of slavery, we have come. To abolish women's oppression, to get rid of women's exploitation, to stop wife meeting, we have come. To destroy dowry, rape, atrocities of dictators, casteism, communalism, chauvinism, and hierarchical order, we have come. To combat the tyranny and from villages and cities, from fields and mines, officers and factories, we women's groups have come. This is the translation done by Dr. Joy Deshmukh. I had written it originally in um, Hindi. It was inspired by a uh, well-known uh, poet of uh, Free Indian Freedom Movement, uh, Meghani Ji. Meghani Ji had written, uh, uh, he had done the Gujarati translation of international, you know, the working class international, and uh, it is adapted. Uh, we have got the feminist content in the song. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Vibhuti, I'm just stunned. I know that you could have done this talk just informally over a cup of tea, but the range and breadth of what you cover and the fact that you always take the trouble to prepare, uh, I'm just completely in awe. Yeah, and there are so many got thoughts. Got Everything got organized because of this talk. Yeah. No, I mean, just that you, that you, I mean, it's really amazing to me. Um, I have many thoughts and many observations, but I also can pick up a phone and chat with you. So yeah. let me open the floor to others first. Um, particularly those who were not born in these years. So I think in chat box, she has written, which I said also, that Seema Sakre played a very important role mm -hmm. uh, right from the very beginning. Right? It is because of her efforts that for eight years, Mathura could fight the case. No? Then, uh, yeah, you have written about Lata Mani's role. That too I spoke about. No, uh, no, no. This is actually my Sudha, the yeah. archives curator, yeah. was, a, was a third year student in Elphinstone when the gang rape happened. Yeah. And uh, so she was one of the students who organized the protests and shut down the college for several months. Yeah, at that oh, point. yeah that was very, uh, yeah, I remember. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. After that, I think, yeah, in Xavier's college. Yeah. In Elphinstown College. El yeah, Elphinstown College. Yeah, we had come. You, in fact, that time you had invited us also, no? I was not there. She was there. I had already graduated and gone. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. But I they think. also had a... a a Kama Hall program that okay. I remember seeing yes, yes. all of you and T start. I came yeah. because Sudha was an organizer. Yes, yes. She was, Sudha was an organizer. Yeah. Yes, I remember. I mean, for me, one of the big changes from what from those times, I, I think so much. Madhu Kishwar is the only one in the in the 1980 conference whose rhetoric was not really um, socialist or Marxist, I mean, she, as far as I remember. Correct. But the movement away, I mean, what we are now talking about is intersectionality was essentially that socialist Marxist feminism Correct. that I heard all of you talk about yes, yes. way back then. And I'm always struck by the fact that every generation discovers things as if they are new. Yeah. But socialist feminists, they said that what we believe, we are against all forms of hierarchy. And women's predicament are determined by interplay of caste, class, race, religion, mm -hmm. ethnicity. So that was very much there in the early 80s also. Yeah, yeah in all, yeah. But then the term intersectionality was not there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always struck by that. And also the fact that uh, I think when I, even now when I hear uh, any of us talk, I think our accent is on structures, yeah. structural yeah. change, institutional change. But with the younger feminists with whom I work a lot now at Pragna, there is also the importance of the interpersonal, which is, I think, the, the value that they have added to the women's movement. Yeah. You know, talking much more about uh, 
what we might have dismissed as domestic or private issues, personal choice issues, bringing them into the mainstream and into the public discourse, whether it's dress or it's sexuality or it's relationships. It's sort of an interesting... Uh, now, today, while speaking only, I realized that I should add some more thing about the uh, big rally in Pune, Medha Lele and all had, was uh, on Satyam Shivam Sundaram. No? In fact, th that was the one thing which brought in the question of uh, women in media, portrayal of women in cinema, mm -hmm. print media uh, to center stage. After that, I think a lot of other experiments also were made. But the first direct action was in uh, Dhule also and uh, in Pune. That was in 78 or so. Uh, and in Ahmedabad, we had in 74 by uh, Avaj, Ahmedabad women section group. Uh, it started with uh, all those uh, Gujarati plays with the double meaning, no? with the sexual in and, in and, those and uh, they were very uh, extremely crude, crass, you can say depiction of women in those comedy plays of Gujarati. So they started with that. Sujata Chavan says talks about the early 80s yeah. and Rinal Thai's rallies in Goregaon yeah. for dow on dowry and also for water supply. Yeah, uh, Shakti has a question for you. Yeah. With age being another component of intersectionality, how do you see intergener intergenerational solidarities being built in the feminist movement today? Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to take the question while we have yeah. time? I think now. Uh, Intergeneration solidarity can be built only when there is a humility among the uh, senior feminists who are in the power structures. So I think that within whichever organization you are, uh, if uh, you say that just because we are experienced or our generation did that and you belittle the younger people and uh, also don't do power sharing, then intergenerational solidarity can't happen because I have seen it in the UN meeting or in the Western country. Mm -hmm. They announced that anyone who is above 30 should leave the room. No? That kind of uh, anger younger women have. I've seen it mm -hmm. in Latin American feminists or even other Asian countries. But uh, it's, it's all a question of a power sharing. I think power sharing, respect, mutual respect, and also openness. Like so many things we are not uh, familiar with when it comes to LGBTQIA issue or a queer, queer studies, language itself is known, uh, not known to us. The terminologies we use uh, in, this, in the second generation feminism, the way they use it. So that itself is uh, very new to us. So keeping an open mind, listening to what younger generation is saying, not being judgmental, mm -hmm. and also in a day-to-day -day happening or interpersonal relationship, if we are more democratic, and there is a mutuality in the relationship and there is a power sharing. Each one needs voice. So I think the, the, uh, all, um, if we control power, then there can't be any intergenerational. Mm -hmm. and especially after NGOization, the, those who are board of trustees and those who are directors and all, the relationship between them and the young women, they perceive themselves as employees. No? So in, in so many NGOs, there have been unions also. And especially the question of uh, Me Too movement, you have seen Me Too movement is not only in academia or in Bollywood and Hollywood. Me Too movements are also there within social movements. No? Yeah. And what stand do we take? I have to tell you, Vibhuti, that Pragna has a board which is, I think, about 50% below 40. Yeah. So um, we, I'm hoping very hard to make the transition. Perfect and hand things over to them. So we uh, feel good about that. But- You are um, also so egalitarian and giving, no? So that is the, you are not a megalomania. So you would have that kind hopefully. of- Hopefully, yeah. you have to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, Kushbu Ahire says, wonderful and very insightful session, Professor Vibhuti. I feel so grateful that because of the activists like you, things have improved in society and we're able to live in a better world. Thank you for arranging this, she says to us. Yeah. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thank you. I also feel so good. No, this is so many things I realized while speaking, no? Because when I made PPT and now I'm seeing these names and all the moment I saw Mehda Lele, I realized that in my 78 they had such a big yeah. event. Then yeah. about beauty contest also we had no? this demonstration in Shanmukhanan Hall. So I realized. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. But focus was on photographs. So I think wherever I had photographs, I took those episodes. So. Yeah, yeah. No, this is amazing, actually. And also, we are very lucky. For anybody who doesn't know, um, we have, Prashnaya maintains a visual archive, which is how I know that Vibhuti has these amazing photos, because she is a genuine, a generous contributor to our archives. And you can look up her photos and others. Our accent is on women's work in the public sphere. And the inspiration for this was actually knowing women in all our lives who may have gone to protests or who may have made contributions of their jewelry or made you know choices to never wear silk again personal political choices or public political choices that uh, made a difference to the world at large but then we forget from one generation to another so the idea was that we would gather those stories and gather those images um, for everybody to share and to collectively remember that, uh, in fact, as the button that Vibhuti gave me in 1980 said, women hold up half the sky. Yeah. So uh, Akriti says, thank you for mentioning the LGBTQIA plus community. Can you share how we can make gender and development, GAD, more inclusive for the community and the, as the language focuses on binaries? I think so. I think most important thing is that more uh, orientation is required because see the uh, still uh, when we talk about gender, we are mostly talking about women. That I, I am also guilty of that. You no, know? I do gender audit of budget, but mostly my focus is on women and children. Uh, so after making some generalized statements, we get into the nitty gritty and the lived experience of women. So I think more, uh, more, even LGBTQIA movement also will have to focus on livelihood issues. Currently focus is on identity. Most of the discourse, those who come from a very affluent background or those who have a secure job and this, for them it's okay. Like they're talking only about identity. But for large majority of LGBTQIA people, when I see that in Ashram Shara, so many girls, they've been persecuted. They have killed themselves because they were, less, they were found uh, to be lesbian. Or we can see the, the question of uh, transgender children who are abandoned by their own family members or those who want to enter the educational institutions and they are not allowed. Uh, not a single university except for TISS has a hostel for transgender students. Only in TISS we have a ground floor of women's uh, hostel, which is uh, for transgender LGBTQIA students. You don't even have that. So I think we will have to take up the material issues and the how the, their survival struggles. No, uh, that has to be taken up, and that is we brought that. That is the only way to make people who are thinking, who who may be, uh, in terms of their perspective, who may be uh, sensitive about intersectionality. But how does it translate into actual action? Which doesn't happen. What we have is only platitudes. No, that okay, we have our solidarity matter mm -hmm. ends that. Full stop. But how do you, in whichever way you are, whether you are an employer or whether you are an expert or academician or researcher, in your worldview, is it a part of integral? It, is it an integral part? So for that, even the sectarianism of LGBTQIA should also go. And at the same time, the humility among all those who are for social transformation and who believe in gender equality, they also should be humble enough to learn from this uh, new this thing because now in in one meeting uh, the transgender cope and panelists he told me there are 48 types of identities now we don't know about 48 types of identities so we need the kind of you know this whatever i talked to you about the women's issues whether it was a sex selection question of sex selection we used to have six seven eight full day workshops just to understand historical legacy of sun preference, uh, sociocultural aspect, proverbs of our country, uh, like the legal structure and the medical science, how it responds to sex, uh, to, to women's question or a question of uh, gender identities. So it requires tremendous effort on those, for those who are also uh, talking about these new insights, no? So we can't be in our silos. We, we need to reach out to each other because solidarity can't be only in abstract. I can exp explain to you 
a very <laughs> i can share my experience of uh, mm -hmm. students program uh, at tiss like they would have a because you have a school school of development studies with so many centers with so, with specialized courses and all so first session is on the overall problems in inequality in indian society where you will have a leftist panelist so one group of students will come once the tea break takes place all of them leave along with the panelists second panel is led by the tribal studies uh, tribal uh, on tribal question then all the tribal students come then the lunch break takes place everybody including panelists leave. first lunch you have a dalit student uh, the uh, question, dalit question you discuss dalit then all the dalit activists come along with the panelists they also leave fourth side question you have on a women's question or a gender then they come next day you have on media they, so all of them are discussing the panelists and the participants all of them want to listen to only their world view so they, there is no interaction even if it is in the same institution same uh, hall you see that people are not ready to reach out to each other so i think this sectarianism everyone will have to give up feminists will have to give up uh, lgbtqia movement will have to give up women from where at in a one platform we are discussing say communalism and women when you discuss the family laws all the secular people leave and when you are discussing communalism women are not there they are only discussing about the communal uh, issues but they there the women's question is not there. so i think that will have to go and we all will have to show solidarity in praxis not only in rhetorics so that is the only way i can see that we can and mm -hmm. uh, and i know lgbtqia question we need a lot of mainstreaming of the issue it's very important and for that we need to have a dialogue with those who are in state and non state actors or with all of them so with the ngo social movement civil society organization community based organization we need to in each and every workshop we have we need to have a session on this questions and also when it comes to the you know state uh, this thing programs currently gender sensitization is a big thing everywhere all universities colleges mm -hmm. government departments are organizing that is there a module on lgbtqia or alternate mm -hmm. sexuality no it is not there so we have to push that also then only the mindset changes yeah Uh, Garima writes, "Thank you for this session, Professor Vibhuti, and sharing both the historical and some of your personal trajectory through these movements in Maharashtra. I loved learning about the different strategies that you used for different cases." And Akriti says, "Thank you. Your perspective is thought engaging for me." Thank you. Uh, but... Thanks a lot for patient listening and very good positive feedback. Yeah. No, I mean this is actually quite amazing. There are many things that I want to say. I mean. on the question of reaching out multi generational conversations and i i have long thought that uh for all the limitations that the pandemic placed on us one thing that it has now made possible is um the ease of dialogue that would have otherwise involved venues travel food you know to be able to get on calls like this and to have conversations I, this is something i've actually uh wanted to do but haven't done is to just have several generations of feminists in a group this small that we can just talk about these things from multiple perspectives as you say for many of us uh, the vocabulary about uh, gender identity is new and we may be open to learning it but i would also like someone to be open to teaching me because it's not a given that everybody has the same exposure but if we adopt i think if we think of ourselves as all being on journeys with different road maps and that when we meet we share with each other openly as you say absolutely we end up listening to what we are already familiar with a whole lot more than what we are unfamiliar with so uh you know vibhuti when we start doing those dialogues i will be calling you you know that no that's <laughs> So on that note we have a tradition of finishing almost exactly on time it's 5 minutes 5 minutes past 12 thank you everybody for coming vibhuti thank you so much i know that uh, this history of the women's movement that you have done for us authoritatively and engagingly 
is going to be an oft-watched video on our channel. Yeah. So thank you very much.